Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, Perceptron and gradient descent. First, a couple of announcements. Uh, homework 1 is out if you guys haven't seen it yet. It's both on the course website and on Moodle. Uh, it's due next Tuesday at uh, January 12th at 2 p.m. by Moodle. There should be uh, uh, one of those entries where you can submit your uh, assignment electronically on Moodle. So please sign up for Moodle Piazza if you haven't yet. Uh, announcements are made via Piazza. So if I have someone announce about the course, say homework's released, or there's a typo in my slides, or whatever, it's, it'll be made via Piazza. So if you're not on Piazza, you won't be getting those announcements. And again, the, the, there's a recitation on Python programming tonight for machine learning. It'll be here in this room at 7.30 p.m. should last about an hour. Although the room is booked for an hour and a half in case people have extra questions. Okay, so just a recap of uh, last time. Here's the basic recipe that we talked about for machine learning. You collect the training set of input features with some representation, in this case a d-dimensional feature space. You, you annotate those training data. In this simplest case, let's say it's a binary classification problem. You choose a model class, and we're going to primarily look at linear models uh, for at least, for about half of this class, we'll be looking for just at linear models. And you choose a loss function. This, char this characterizes how well your model is predicting uh, on this training set. So you know, if the true label is, a, is A and your model predicts B, you know, this is square loss. This is, how, this is how poorly your model is, uh, this quantifies how poorly your model is doing on this training data for some parameterization of your model class. And then the learning objective, given all of this, is to solve this optimization problem where you want to find the parameterization you want to find the parameterization of your model class that minimizes your loss function over your training set. Okay? So this is the basic recipe. Uh, we talked a little bit about the bias variance trade-off, which is an important concept in thinking about things like concepts like overfitting, excess model capacity, making sure your learning procedure is stable with respect to the size of training data and complexity of your model class. So for example, in this uh, uh, simple one-dimensional case where the blue, where the red dots are the true density distribution, and you just sample a small subset for your training, a linear model class looks like this on average with some deviation, quadratic, cubic, and then you can see the bias variance trait. This should just be reviewed from last time. And the final sort of concept we talked about last time is things like, you know, given sort of these types of issues, you know, we want to do something like cross-validation and model selection in order to select the model that is not overfitting too much to uh, a small finite training set. And the way you do that is you, know, you just uh, hold out one piece of your training data as a validation set, and then you train on the rest, and you rotate until you s figure out which model class you like best. Cross-validation is not the only way to use a validation set. It's just the one way. And if you're interested, there are resources on the website that has other mechanisms for using a validation set. OK, so that's a recap from last time. Today. Uh, we'll actually look at how to solve this problem, right? I mean, I never actually talked about how you solve this optimization problem. And so we'll look at actual two machine learning algorithms or machine learning approaches. The first will be a perceptron algorithm, and the second will be gradient descent. Uh, and this is the one that will actually be used to solve that optimization problem that we uh, set up in the last lecture. So first, uh, perceptron. So the, the perceptron is one of the earliest machine learning approaches. It was actually invented in 1957 by Frank Rosenblatt, who was sort of a kind of engineer, physicist, neuroscientist type person. He was sort of a Renaissance man type person. It's still a great algorithm, the perceptron algorithm. It's fast to implement. It's fast to run. It has a very clean mathematical analysis, which you can use if you're trying to do thought experiments about more complicated learning scenarios. People often first think about how a perceptron would behave in those scenarios before moving on to more complicated learning algorithms. And of course, uh, for those of you who are familiar, especially if you've taken CNS courses, you know that the perceptron is the precursor, was uh, conceptually the precursor to more advanced neural networks. And this, if you haven't seen it, is the Mark I machine uh, built by IBM, uh, the Mark I perceptron machine. So this is actually a physical implementation of the perceptron. Um, and I believe this particular one, I could be wrong, if memory serves correct, it was doing image classification using 400 sensors. So, the, so D equals 400. That's the number of features. And it was just light intensities, and it was trying to classify images based on them. And of course, machines are huge back then. This is probably not as powerful as we thought. <laughs> OK, so here I'm just going to sort of um, formula, uh, formally describe the perceptron learning algorithm for linear classification. 
and then we'll walk through intuitively what's going on. So this is how the perceptual learning algorithm works. And you know, you could, in this, in this particular case, you're, it's a linear model with a weight vector and a bias. Uh, that should be one, not t, I'll fix that. So you, start, you initialize all your parameters to be zero. And just a re recap on notation, this is your training set, you your finer classification problem. <laughs> well, what the perceptual learning algorithm does is it does a loop, you know, and t will be the uh, index that sort of uh, keeps track of where we are in the loop. And, uh, and at every iteration within this loop, we receive a training example from the training set. And for now, you can just think of it as any arbitrary order. In practice, many people uh, do this in random order. So for every iteration of this inner loop, we sample a random, or we go through the training set in random order, we sample from randomly. But for now, you can just think of it arbitrarily. Arbitrary order, we receive some example from the training set. If our current model classifies uh, if our current model classifies this example correctly, as indicated by this if statement, then we don't make any updates to our model, right? Our new model is exactly the same as our old model. If otherwise, in which case, you know, our model misclassifies this, then we make an update, and the update is simply the previous model, the current model, in the direction of the, pre in the, direction of the, uh, uh, of the training example. So uh, x is a d-dimensional vector, w is a d-dimensional vector, y is a scalar. <laughs> and then the bias gets updated like this. Very simple algorithm. And then there's a termination condition, which I'll describe, um, in the, which I'll describe shortly, although there are many different termination conditions one could do. <laughs> so before I talk about all the intuition of behind the perception algorithm, so are there any questions, by the way, on this? Should be fairly straightforward. Okay, so uh, in order to, to understand intuit at an intuitive level what the perception algorithm is doing, it's important to remind ourselves about concepts like hyperplane distance, uh, which is a concept you guys learned from geometry. So a line is a quote unquote one D plane. A line is a one D hyperplane. A, a plane, which uh, what you normally think of as a plane, is a two dimensional hyperplane. And a hyperplane is just you know, the generalization. So any d-dimensional hyperplane, uh, so all of these are special cases of a hyperplane. And so a hyperplane is defined by a, a normal, a, the, the normal vector to the hyperplane, so the orthogonal vector to the hyperplane, plus a bias offset, right? So you know, when, you, when you learn about sort of line fitting for a two-dimensional line, you know, y equals ax plus b, a would be the special case of w, and then b is the b. So, but in, more generally, uh, for an arbitrary dimensional hyperplane, uh, W is the dimension of the hyperplane and B is a scalar. And so what does that mean sort of visually? So in the two-dimensional case, uh, W corresponds to a line. Hyper, the two-dimensional hyperplane is a line. Sorry, is a line. So in the two-dimensional case, this is a, I'm confusing myself, but you know what I mean. And so this is the normal to the hyperplane. And then this, this, part here corresponds to the, uh, the offset from the origin. So this line, how, far, how far this line passes from the origin is denoted by this. And so what does that mean? Well, OK, suppose we have two examples, a positive example and a negative example. Then the distance, this is a standard, <coughs> standard formula for hyperplane distance. The distance from any point x uh, to this hyperplane is defined by this, which is simply the sine dot product of the normal to the, to the, to the hyperplane with this point minus the bias divided by the norm of the, norm of the, uh, the normal vector. And so this is, so distance is unsigned. The quote unquote <laughs> sign distance is simply, you simply remove the absolute values from the numerator, and that's called the sign distance. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that a linear model is, corresponds equivalently to a, ge to the ge if you use a geometric interpretation, to the unnormalized sign distance of some hyperplane with a bias offset. You could equivalently represent any linear model as some hyperplane with a normal plus an offset. And then the, the linear model, so this, this, remember this is the linear model up here. Right? If you don't divide by this part, if you don't normalize, this is just the linear model. So the geometric interpretation is linear model is 
you know, is it, is, it a, is, it, is it on the positive side, distance side, or the negative side, distance side? If it's close to the hyperplane, the distance is small. If it's far away from the hyperplane, the distance is large. That's it. And then this, this, this direction is what W is. Okay, so with that concept, let's, let's come back to a more visual sort of uh, run-through of perceptron learning. So here I'm just, I just gave, a, this is a pretty contrived example, but here's the positive examples, here are the negative training examples, and it's a two-dimensional space, right? So in the beginning, the perceptron algorithm is at the origin, the model parameters are at the origin, zero, zero. And for the simplicity of this example, I'm gonna ignore the bias, so the bias is always gonna be zero. So we're just gonna be updating the, the W. Okay, so I'm gonna choose an arbitrary example. The first example is always gonna be misclassified. So let's just choose this one. So then we move it, we, so then we, you know, we add, if you remember the, uh, the algorithm, you just remember it. You add to the W, which is initially zero, in that, just basically that, that the, the feature vector corresponds to that infinite sense. That's what we do, right? So this is W, and this is the corresponding hyperplane. And so everything over here is classified as positive by this, by this model, everything over here is classified as negative by this model. Currently. Okay, so we just pick another arbitrary example from our training set. It happens to be this one. It's correct. Because it's correct, correctly classified by this current model, we don't do anything. Right. Pick another arbitrary example. Okay, so this, this is a negative example, but it's on the positive side of the hyperplane. So it's misclassified, so we're going to make an update. And we're going to make the update, you know, instead of going towards this direction because the, the label is negative, we go the negative of that direction, so we, we move this vector, we just simply do vector addition, or in this case, vector subtraction in this direction. That's what, that, that is what it is, is induced by this mistake. And now we have a new hyperplane. And so this is our next, our updated model. So everything over here is classified as positive. Everything over here is classified as negative by our current model. Pick another arbitrary point. It's classified correctly. It's, on the, it's a negative example. It's on the negative side of the current model. So we don't make any updates. And so this you know, continues until we find another misclassified example. So it's a positive example on the negative side. And so we, it induces an update right, towards, towards this example because it's a positive update. So we just to do this vector addition onto our current model. And that's our hyperplane. So now, all the training examples in this training set are correctly classified. There are no more mistakes. You can keep looping ad nauseum and you'll never make another update ever again. Right, at this point, we're done. Questions? Yeah? So is it possible that one of our updates we do will screw up one of the things we already saw before? Yes. Okay. So, so potentially we get worse and worse. Uh, it can oscillate, it could potentially yeah, sure. oscillate, yeah. yeah. But let me just go through a seven, another example, right? Because I, I just went through an arbitrary sequence of training examples, just do another arbitrary sequence, a different sequence, right? So let's start again. This guy, right? We start. We arbitrarily chose this guy, and remember the weight vector is zero at the beginning, so it's all, 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 always misclassified at the very beginning. So we make a, you know, make an update in the negative direction because this is a negative example. So, we, so this is our current weight vector yeah, after one update. So everything over here is going to be classified as positive by a current model, and everything over here is going to be classified as negative by a current model. Pick another arbitrary example. It's classified correctly. No update. Pick another example. Correct. No update. Ah, misclassified. Okay, so then we make an update in the negative direction of this example, because it's a negative example. That's our current model. Simple vector addition. Keep going. Misclassified. Make an update. Misclassified. Make an update. Misclassified. Make an update. Oh, look. It's still misclassified, right? We made an update, but it was such a small... The, 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 the magnitude of this example is so small that even after one update, it was still misclassified. And in fact, it's the only misclassified example, so we're just going to make an update in that exact same direction again. And after two updates in that direction, um, we now have a perfect model. A model that makes some mistakes. So that's related to your question. So you could have easily, I could have fudged the, the locations of this simple 2D example in a way that uh, we made a mistake over something that was classified correctly before. Um, 
Okay. <laughs> so just to recap, now that you have a visual sort of an intuition of what's going on, let's look at the pseudocode again, right? So we start with uh, a zero, zero, and then we do, it, we do a loop. And implicitly in this loop, at, at least for now, the termination condition is when there's no more mistakes, right? And you could check that by just doing a, a for loop over your other training examples and verifying that you have not made any mistakes. Receive examples in some arbitrary order. <coughs> if the current model cur cur predicts this example correctly, we make no update. If the current model makes a mistake, we update in the sign direction of the training example features. That's it. This is the entire perceptron algorithm. Invented in 1957. For linear classification. There are variants of it now for regression and so on and so forth. Multi-class classification, which we'll talk to next week. We'll talk about next week. Okay, so now let's compare the two models, right? We, I just showed you two runs of the perception algorithm with two arbitrary orderings over the training examples of this training set. What, and these are the two models uh, that were returned by those two runs of the algorithm. Obviously, it's hard to generalize from sample size of two, but can anyone tell me an intuition about where they think all the return models will look like? <coughs> Should be fairly intuitive. First guess is probably correct. Any takers? Separating hyperplane. That's right. So there's a notion called a separating hyperplane. All of the models in this case will return some line close to these two lines that split all the positive examples on this side and all the negative examples on this side. And there's many different ones you could choose within this band. And the perception algorithm for this simple example will always return one of them, no matter what ordering of the examples. So to formalize this concept, there's a notion, there's a notion called linearly, linear separability or linearly separable. So a training set is considered linearly separable for binary classification if there exists some hyperplane that is mistake free, right? It always classifies the positive examples on one side and the negative examples on the other side. There's another concept called a margin. What a margin says is, okay, you know, how stable is this classifier, right? If there's a big margin, that means there are that, that means there's a big sort of region where I could be mistake free. If the margin is small, that means that there's only a small region where I could be mistake free. And so formally, mathematically, what that is is, you know, this is the margin, right? The margin is the minimum signed distance. And we, maximize, we try to maximize the minimum sign distance over all possible w. So this is the w that has the maximum minimum distance, right? These are the two points. These are the two points closest to the hyperplane. And we want to find the w that, had, that maximizes the distance of the closest point to the hyperplane. So that's called a margin. So a classification problem is called linearly separable. If there exists a hyperplane with perfect classification accuracy, and I'm ignoring the bias term for now. The bias term you can add it on here with no modification to the state. Furthermore, a classification problem is called separable with a margin gamma for you know, this, this term. And if you have this term first, if you define this term first, then a model, then a classification problem is considered linearly separable if this gamma is strictly non-negative, non strictly positive, excuse me, strictly positive. So this is a sort of an if and only if type statement. <coughs> Furthermore, and I won't go through the proof, but there, there is a proof, and it's a very old one by now, that for if, if your learning problem is linearly separable, then for an arbitrary ordering over the training examples, the number of mistakes that the perceptual learning algorithm will make before it becomes mistake free is bounded by this quantity, where this again is the margin, right? And this is basically the quote unquote radius of the feature space. So it's the, it's the size of your largest input feature. Okay? So it's just the radius of the search space of your model class, essentially. Because since your model, since your perception starts at zero, the largest it will ever move in a single increment is R. 
right? The largest update it has is R, because it's, and so that's that's where this term comes into play. So what does this mean? This means uh, the smaller your features are, so the the more compact your representation is, the fewer mistakes it, it can make. The bigger your margin is, the more the fewer mistakes it'll make. Right? As as the problem, so as this point and this point become closer and closer together, and as the margin uh, grows to zero, shrinks to zero, then the number of mistakes grows unbounded. And the only way that can happen is if it keeps making mistakes on, on the same examples over and over and over again. And because in that case, it becomes not linearly separable. So for those of you who've taken CS156, this should mostly pretty much all work for you. Of course, in the real world, most problems are not actually linearly separable. Right? Uh, it's very hard to find a problem that's actually linearly separable. And so when that is the case, the perception may never converge. It may keep oscillating between some, a bunch of suboptimal solutions. So what do we do? Any guesses? Yep. That is definitely one thing people do. Um, it's actually not the most popular thing, though. Yep. Minimize the margin. So that's not what they do with a perceptron. So it is something that people do, but not with a perceptron. And we'll talk about that next week. Yeah. They keep a record of the one that misclassified the least number of training samples. And so for you, you keep updating, but as long as you don't find an update that's better than your yep. least one, you can That is very close to what people typically do. They actually do that, but on the validation side. Um, so you know, if your data set is big enough, you just have a validation set. And this, is, this, this uh, method, in general, that it, doesn't, it doesn't apply just for perceptrons. People use it more generally. It's called early stopping via validation. So you keep, you have a training set, you have a validation set. Let's say both are sufficiently large, so we don't, we're not doing cross validation for now. Although you can think about ways of combining all this. So you run perceptron learning on the training set, you validate on the validation set, and then after some maximum number of iterations, you pick the one that has the highest. So you pick the, so you run for some maximum number, number of iterations, and then you of those you pick the one that has the best accuracy on the validation set. That's essentially what people do. Sometimes people just stop immediately when the accuracy stops improving. So they, so they, they just say, as soon as the accuracy starts going, uh, actually starts going down a little bit, we just stop. Sometimes people have a fixed time horizon that they choose the best model from the validation afterwards. Either is fine. And so this is called early stopping. There's a Wikipedia article on it. It's pretty, it's pretty nice encyclopedic description of early stopping in all its uses. So within machine learning, there's a concept of online learning versus batch learning. In online learning, the learning algorithm, the learning problem is defined as, you, as the learning algorithm receives a stream of data. It doesn't see all the data at once. It sees a stream of data, and it may choose to make incremental updates to the model as it sees this stream of data. So perceptron learning is an instance of online learning. The alternative to online learning is called batch learning, or it's also known as offline learning, but it's more commonly called batch learning. And what batch learning does is that you get all the training data at once, and then when you make an update, you look at all the training data uh, uh, first, and then make a single update simultaneously considering all the training data. Or at least that's what, or at least you're allowed to do that. The learning algorithm is given access to all the data simultaneously. Now, of course, you can use online learning algorithms for batch learning, right? There's a, there's a straightforward reduction, right? I have a batch learning problem. I can convert it to an online learning problem by not allowing the learning algorithm to see all the data simultaneously. Right? I, just, uh, I, just, I just have a subroutine that streams data from my batch learning problem to the online learning algorithm. Right? So what that means is any, you can use an online learning algorithm to, in a batch learning setting, but not vice versa, typically in practice. I mean, you could. You could do something convoluted, like you just wait until you collected all your data, and then you train. But that's typically not how to think about these things.
So in some sense, online learning is less restrictive. Okay, let's just recap the perceptron. It's one of the first machine learning algorithms ever invented. Actually, at the time when it was invented, machine learning as a concept hadn't really been sort of cohesively um, defined at that point. Yet. Uh, the benefits are it's simple to fat, it's simple and fast. So it, 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 it's easy to implement. It runs really quickly uh, when you uh, when you actually run it. Um, it has a very clean mathematical analysis. I actually didn't talk about the analysis, uh, but if you are interested in the mathematical analysis of the perceptron. It's available on this, uh, on, this, uh, on this link. It's also linked to off the website. Uh, if you're a PhD student in CMS or CNS or ED, I would highly recommend that you actually read this. Um, the analysis, understanding how the analytical tools used to reason about these machine learning algorithms, uh, I think is would be very valuable for you moving forward. But this class, you know, we're not going to focus on that as much. We're going to more focus on practical issues. Okay, so what are the drawbacks of the perceptron algorithm? Well, you know, it, it might not convert to a very good model, right? Because, you know, if the data is not linearly separable, um, you know, it just doesn't convert. Furthermore, you know, in the, in the first lecture, previous lecture, I sort of gave this sort of very philosophical talk about how we're, you define a loss function and you minimize your loss function. That's how you do basic machine learning. There is no loss function here. I did not define any, I just defined an algorithm. What is, what is, and you know, there is a mistake bound, but the mistake bound and a loss function are somewhat two separate, somewhat uh, separate concepts. So what is the perceptual algorithm actually optimizing? Is there, not, is there an objective function? And we'll get back to this at the end of this lecture. But a, at, at the beginning when um, the perception algorithm was first invented from a more sort of neuroscience-y type of sort of inspiration, there was actually no objective function. It was just, this is what we do in response to this. It's just an algorithm. Which is not typically how we think about machine learning these days. 60 some years, years later. Okay, so any questions about perceptron? This is uh, one of the homework questions. Yeah. I see. So if, if you make a mistake on a positive label, you you want to you want to update your model in the positive direction of the features of this input training example. If you make a mistake on a negative training example, so the y is negative, you want to make an update in the negative direction of your input features of, of that training example. So and that's illustrated. Um, uh, let's see, let me just go up this goes to real quick. Um, so, right. So this one's misclassified. Right? So this feature, the feature vector corresponding to this example is this arrow. Right? That's, that's the feature vector corresponding to this example. So then we just make, and this is a positive example, so we just make an update, vector update, vector addition update like this, and that's our new model. Now when we make a misclassification on a negative example, this is the feature direct. The feature vector course that represents this negative example is the, is the vector from the origin to this example. But because it's a negative example, we negate it. Right, so now it's pointing from the here to the origin. And this is the arrow we add to it. This is the vector we add to our curve model. Not from here to here, here to here. And it goes like this. So y is a scalar. So it's just a, and then x is a vector. Yeah. 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 Is there an intuition for what? Because like the bias step seems like it's kind of hard. Because you have like a small radius of your data, and plus or minus one could be totally jumping around. So you can think of the bias. You can think of you can think of every training example as always having a fixed feature of value one. Okay. It's a quote mathematical quote. Okay. So you never like add like a weighting like because intuitively it seems like you like it might be useful to have like a small weight like you know like epsilon times y for the bias so you aren't making huge jumps. So if you think of bias, you don't you don't want to make huge biases. Uh, so okay. So in practice, well. I don't actually know what people do in practice. Um, people, I don't 
don't think this is a thing people think about. But if you really, if, if, if it is something that is a concern, you would just say, well, I, I'm going to pretend that the fixed feature for the bias is not one, but point one. Right? And then you, every time you make an update on the bias, you update it by point one. But then every time you, then, but then in your scoring rule, but then in your scoring rule, you'd have to multiply this by point one as well, because it's being multiplied by feature value of point one, not one. So then you get, you get that. Yeah, I'm just imagining a case where like, the radius of your data is like point zero zero one. Yeah. So if everything's in that ball, then it's going like, to add that bias is going to be shifting you all over the place. But maybe it's not actually. If your features are yeah. that small, then they probably aren't that dis I mean, well, okay, there's a skill. There's, there's, there's a, there's a, okay, it's a little technical, yeah. but assuming that your features have some normalized semantic oh, meaning, okay. um, then if your feature is actually that small, they're probably not that pretty semantic okay. meaning. So we're assuming there's some implicit normalization that makes everything out of But if you want to analyze, yeah, I mean, it, I don't want to get into it, it becomes like, okay. I don't, a precise statement requires a lot of sort of stuff, okay. but that's sort of the intuition. <laughs> if we are doing an update on, uh, on B, right? Uh, you, we are doing an update on B, and uh, we got all the data sets with uh, Y uh, equals uh, plus one. So uh, I think the B goes in one direction. So it, it goes, so if, if that is the case, uh, first of all, in, in the homework, not all the, not all the Y's are plus one. But if it is the case that all the Y's are plus one, so then you, then you have a bounded the, number of mistakes, because yeah. that's a trivially linearly separable model. Right, because all the examples are plus one. Right, if all if there, you only have positive examples, any line over here is a, separates it from the negatives. Right, yeah. so the model so it's trivially okay. it's literally separable. Right, uh, the margin is well since you start from zero, the margin. Okay, anyways, um, it's trivially linearly separable, and the size of B equals the size of the number of mistakes you make in, the, in your perceptual learning algorithm. Right, every single time you make a mistake, you add one to B. Right? Yeah. And so the number of, because it's linearly separable, the number of mistakes is bounded. <laughs> Therefore, the perception will return a model that is equal to the, where the bias is equal to the number of mistakes you made during the training. Uh, but, but if the initial value of B is big enough, you will never get the answer, right? The initial value of B is big enough. If the initial value Since of Since B, B is updating in one direction. Yeah. Big enough. Uh, B, if your training examples are all positive, B can never be. So oh, they're all. Okay. Yeah. Um, if your training examples are all positive, it's kind of a degenerate learning. Um, yeah. Uh, Even if the problem is correct for yourself. I, I'm not really sure I understand uh, the concern you're making. If, if, if the examples are all positive. Yeah. All it, the model, the, the problem is trivially linearly separable. So it must be the case that any person, the perception algorithm terminates. So you may have an initial B that's maybe weird and large, but after, after a finite number of updates, you'll have converged to a perfect model, in which case the B will stop updating. It won't diverge to infinity. All right, so I'm going to move on to stochastic gradient descent. <laughs>